tonight we're going to talk about year-end planning, probably one of the more important topics uh, that I talk about, uh, aside from Power of Inc., the power of incorporating and utilizing entity structures to help shelter assets, not only from a liability perspective, but also potentially to help you save a little bit of tax. Um, this happens to be one of my favorite topics because we're winding down 2022. So each year in the fourth quarter, use it or lose it is always the go-to topic. Uh, just to make sure that everybody understands that as we wind down the end of the year, it's really important for you to sit down with your tax advisors, with your wealth managers or financial advisors, and just figure out position-wise where what you're looking like uh, prior to December 31st. That way, when tax season rolls around, you're not rolling into your tax preparer's office uh, and hit with any surprises. So map out a plan, uh, put a plan in place, because ultimately failing to plan is our plan, failing to uh, planning to fail. Oh, wait, hang on. failing to plan is ultimately planning to fail. I usually get that right on the right on the dot, but I'm a little little under the weather today. Uh, so you got to put a plan in place to hopefully, uh, you know, position yourself in a way to help you retain wealth. What you might consider to be tax savings, I consider it to be wealth retention. So it's all about planning ahead to keep more in your own pockets. Um, myself, I've been working with Robert Hall and Associates. Gosh, it seems like uh, for, for 40, 50 years, I feel like I have 50 years of information in my head, but I'm going on two decades with Robert Hall and Associates. Um, I, I'm not only an enrolled agent, I file roughly about 1,200 tax returns per year personally uh, at a firm that services well over 10,000 tax filings per year. We're located in sunny Southern California, right off the 134 at Brandon Central in Glendale, but we do actually file taxes in all 50 states. Uh, and individually, actually, that number might be a little out of date. I think I'm in the 500 million range in managed real estate and other business dealings for my clientele roster. Uh, and on the speaking side, we do over 140 free educational webinars and events on a year to year basis. We really fought hard about a decade ago, maybe a little bit more than a decade ago, to really bring all of this education uh, to as many people who were willing to spend some time to listen to the topic of taxation, um, you know, and, and make it free for everybody. Because a lot of this stuff, it's when you open up the internal revenue code or pull it up online, it's, it's hieroglyphics to the general public. Uh, so it's better, it's better to get those answers to people and this education in, in the most efficient and free way possible. I by no means am a one-man operation. I work alongside a wonderful senior consulting staff. Um, and yes, there is another Watson that works at the firm. That is actually my big brother, Michael Watson. Um, he is now currently stand-in CEO for the firm coming out of the pandemic. So we're really rocking and rolling and, and hopefully bringing our firm in a, in a little bit of a different direction coming out of this very kind of dark two and a half, three year period. Our firm's been around for 50 plus years, though. We've been around since 1971, and Bob Hall really wanted to start this firm and make it kind of a one-stop shop for all of your financial needs. Like I mentioned, we service roughly over 10,000 tax filings across the U.S. on a year-to-year -year basis, and our clientele roster is well over a billion dollars in real estate operations, management, and wholesaling. I'd say that probably out of the 10 plus thousand returns that we file each year, I'd say that probably about 80% of them are real estate investors and small business owners. Uh, so we see a lot of a lot at Robert Hall and Associates. There probably isn't a day that goes by in my office that we don't see a 1031 exchange or a, a, you know, a, a, a um, conservation easement filing or a syndication type investment. So we do see a lot of a lot at Robert Hall. Um, and then, like I said, we, we are basically a one-stop shop for all of your financial needs, tax preparation being our number one service, but we do also offer incorporating services, starting LLCs, S-Corps, C-Corps for people. Uh, we do internal auditing, financial planning on the tax side, uh, bookkeeping services, you name it, we've got it for you. So I don't want to waste too much time uh, tonight on that. So I'm going to jump right into the bread and butter tonight. Uh, a lot of people wonder why, why anybody would want to sit down with a tax advisor outside of tax season, right? Um, well, I usually ask in my consultations with both new and current clients uh, what they want to get out of this year in planning consultation. Why do they feel like it's important for us to sit down prior to the end of the year? And the number one answer is always to avoid unnecessary penalties and interest. Right? We all have an obligation to pay tax to Uncle Sam, but not a penny more than that obligated amount. And if you don't put a plan in place prior to the end of the year, you're going to overpay Uncle Sam, I guarantee that. Uh, and you're not going to like what you pay because not only are you paying the tax, but you're being penalized for not prepaying certain amounts prior to the end of the calendar year. So it's really important to map out and wind down the calendar year before the end of the fourth quarter. Uh, number two answer is for positioning power. You know, where am I sitting snapshot wise as of today? What, November 17th? Year to date income minus year to date expenses that bottom line net profit, how much tax am I gonna to have to pony up to Uncle Sam and the state agencies, whatever state I'm filing in, uh, when it comes time to file? And what can I, how can I position myself to pay less? Now that we know what we're up against, 
What can I go out and reinvest my profit back into? Maybe purchasing more company assets, upgrading uh, a property, you know, put, doing that remodel prior to the, the end of the calendar year and capturing that deduction in 2022. How do I position myself to keep more of that money in my bank account and retain more of that wealth that I've worked so hard to obtain over the past, you know, 365 days? So that's the number two answer. Number three is probably one of my favorite, peace of mind. Right, people want to know what they're up against before the year is even up. Obviously, we don't want to be able to tell the future in some cases, right? Because that can get kind of dark if you could tell the future on yourself. But uh, at the end of the day, we want to know that we're not going to get hit with this massive windfall payment uh, to Uncle Sam in the state of California uh, if it can be avoided, right? So year end planning, whether it's the answer number one, number two, number three, it doesn't matter what the answer is from you. I think that year end planning is equally as important for all people. Um, whether you're a real estate investor, even a W-2 wage earner needs to do something called a W-4 review, which we'll discuss in the next slide, just to make sure that you're on track to probably what I consider to be the best scenario, which is breaking even when you file the return. I always, I always love hearing clients say, you know, they're very happy that they're getting money back. You know, I'm getting this $10,000, $15,000 refund. But I said, well, I'm happy that you're not owing and I'm happy that you're happy, but you just gave the government a ten to $15,000 interest-free loan over the course of the last 12 months. And the government's just giving your money back to you and they control the time frame on that refund. And let's face it, during the pandemic, with the lack of employment at the IRS, you know, the IRS agencies and the, the state agencies, some refunds were delayed three, four, five months, maybe even longer than that because of the, the pipeline just being completely backed up. Three million plus documents behind in processing during the pandemic at the IRS level. So I would much rather people shoot for that break-even scenario, maximize the cash in their own pockets, and give themselves the opportunity to invest that money in probably the most consistent dividend paying investment we could park our money in, right? Which is real estate. So that that's, I always pitch real estate to my clients because number one, it is the most consistent dividend paying investment. And number two, whether the economy is good or bad, guess what? People will always need a place to live. And we, it happens to be a great tax shelter as well. Um, for the employees that come and see us for year-end planning, it, it's a much different, uh, much different conversation. We like to take a look at their current pay stubs uh, or the, their last pay stub. You know, if they come in right now, it's uh, probably a pay stub as of tomorrow, actually, um, which I think is the every two-week pay period as of tomorrow. And we want to see their year-to-date withholding on the federal and the state side. We project what their year, what their annual taxable income will be. We plug it into our calculators and we figure out what they are on track to, to filing. You know, how, how are they going to be receiving refunds, if they're going to owe, if they're going to break even. And if they are on track to receiving a refund, we might be able to adjust their withholding between now and December 31st to take home more in those last two paychecks or last three paychecks of the year. If they're already on pace to getting a refund, maybe that brings them close to a break even. That way they have more liquid cash during the holidays to travel, to reinvest into their, their business investments. Whatever they want to do with their money, that's your money. And so that's all part of year and planning as well. That's called a W-4 review, a review of paycheck uh, stub withholding amounts. For the self-employed individual, W-4 is a little different. We want to know your year-to-date gross income and then what your year-to-date projected expenses are looking like. And then once we come up with that net bottom line, that net profit amount, we can plug it into the calculator, figure out what the liability is, and then talk about what they can expense before the end of the year to help further reduce that taxable income number while keeping in mind that we don't want to wipe out all of the income because if you're looking to purchase property or refinance a property you got to show some sort of income on your return so we do want to keep that in mind especially if you're looking to advance or add to your portfolio in the upcoming years there are a lot of really creative lending options and i heard that there were some lenders in the room so i want to i want to make sure that everybody knows about those new products so talk to the lenders in the room about asset leverage loans about uh, you know, where, where they can take a certain percentage of the retirement value income and, and add that as like a monthly income source. I, I'm not a lender, so I'm not going to go into detail about that. But there are some very creative ways to finance deals uh, currently and moving forward. There might be some very unique products out there for you. But for the self-employed individual, it's all about showing qualified revenue, right? So you need to work with a tax advisor that knows how to take deductions but then when a lender looks at the return, maybe those deductions that you've taken can be added back onto your return as income, maybe showing higher income from a lending perspective, you know, not killing any real estate deals on that end, but on the tax return showing enough or, or a low enough income to, to pay as little tax as possible. Once again, your obligation and overall tax. 
depreciation, for instance, if you go out and you purchase a new vehicle uh, for your business, and let's say that you qualify for the, the bonus depreciation, why don't, we're, we're going to talk about this in a couple of slides as well. But let's say you go out and you purchase a business asset, you accelerate the write-off as a depreciation expense and wipe out all of your income. Great. That's a, that's a fantastic scenario. You're not paying any tax on the return because you've made the right move. You've positioned yourself to take a really, really healthy write-off on the return. Depreciation is unique though. So even though we're taking it dollar for dollar and you're not showing any income on your, on your tax return at the moment, a lender will take that depreciation deduction that saved you all that tax and the lender will add the depreciation back onto your return as income and qualify you for a loan amount based on the higher level of income. So once again, you want to work with a tax advisor who understands a little bit of, of all of the industries and is able to work with lenders to make sure that we're positioning you in the right ways and not killing deals, allowing you for, for more opportunity to add to your portfolio. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, I saw some significant changes in deductions for business owners and real estate investors. I can't tell you how many changes we saw over the last two and a half years, but I want to talk about the top five tax deductions that changed the most over the past three years. Uh, number one, uh, the, the main change, sorry for if the light keeps changing because my screen keeps changing as I flip slides, uh, but number one deduction that I saw change the most in the pandemic years uh, was marketing and advertising. Um, and, it's, and it's crazy because when you look at the returns where marketing and advertising almost tripled or quadrupled, you also saw their revenue, not triple or quadruple, but increase significantly year over year. Uh, marketing and advertising is a great dollar for dollar deduction against taxable income, and it allows you to reach a much larger market, whether it be revamping a website, sending out mailers. I know that we weren't door knocking so much uh, during the pandemic years, and even if we were, people were not opening their doors because they were afraid that you were going to spread this nasty COVID thing. But we saw a lot of people pump a lot of their profit, a lot of the EIDL money, you know, the pandemic related uh, relief funding that came out during the pandemic years, a lot of PPP funds going into paying for extra employees, extra hands on deck, allowing for their marketing departments to expand. And we saw a correlation between this expense and increased revenue in 2020, 2021, and 2022. So another job of a tax advisor is to find as many dollar for dollar write-offs for our clients as possible. This happens to be just a fantastic dollar for dollar deduction for business and real estate investors. Number two, one of my favorite deductions, because, in, and I'll, I'll tell you why it's my favorite deduction in a second, but is professional supplies and equipment. And, and professional supplies and equipment, if you think about this, how many people do we know in our professional circles who can do what they do day in and day out without a computer, without a cell phone, without a desk, without a chair, without a filing cabinet, right? These are some of the most common write-offs for businesses, business owners to have and to acquire, especially during the pandemic years when people had to leave their offices and work from home. They needed new computer equipment. They needed upgraded Wi-Fi equipment. They needed uh, new booklets and tablets and you know uh, mouse pad. I mean, I have a whole setup here at home because I was working from home for almost a year and a half. LA Health Inspector came and shut us down. They said, no way is your tax firm that sees 120 warm bodies on a day-to-day -day basis. No way are you going to stay open during the pandemic. So for a year and a half, I was able to really ramp up my in-home office, and it's a great overall deduction for some of my other side businesses, not so much for my W-2 job. But you know, these are common deductions for business owners, and it has one of the lowest risks for audit on a return because it is the most common deduction for business and real estate investors. Less than a 0.001% chance for audit. In fact, in the 19 years that I've been doing taxes, I have yet to see an audit on a computer purchase. I've yet to see an audit on a cell phone purchase. So these, once again, most common deductions for business owners. And the reason why I really like these deductions on top of it having a low risk for audit is that we have options of how to write it off. So let's say that I've already reinvested all of my profit back into my business for the year and I'm already paying no tax, but I also have this $3,000 laptop that I had to purchase. Well, I can either take the full $3,000 all in one year and exhaust the expense when I didn't really need it, or I can take this $3,000 expense and depreciate it over the lifespan of the asset which for a piece of equipment is seven years. For office furniture, it's five years. So if I don't need the deduction here, I can actually spread it out over the next seven years. Let's say two or three years down the line, my revenue really starts to kick up again. And I want to take the remaining depreciation deduction all in that year to help offset that, that higher income amount. I can then take the remaining four years, three, four years of depreciation and accelerate it in the year when I actually need it. So a number of reasons why I really enjoy this deduction, and I want to make sure that everybody is maximizing this write-off as much as they possibly can on a year-to-year -year basis. Number three, car and truck expenses. I'm sure that people have seen in the news and, and you know, talking amongst 
you know, your, your associates or even at these meetings, you know, the, the, the meetup groups that car prices have just skyrocketed during the pandemic. I mean, the cars that are sitting in our driveways, you could probably sell those vehicles for sometimes five, 10, 15, 20 grand more than what you purchased it for simply because of supply chain issues and chip shortages, right? But there's another reason why the heavier weight vehicle costs have gone through the roof. And when I say heavyweight vehicles, I mean vehicles that weigh over 6,000 pounds. So I'm sure that most of you have heard that, that under the current tax code as of 2022 and 2021, 2020, all the way up through the end of this calendar year, if I went out and purchased a work vehicle, so a, a vehicle for business use that weighed over 6,000 pounds, we're talking about the Tesla Model Xs, we're talking about the, the G-Wagons, the Range Rovers, the Chevy Tahoes, the GMC Sierras, all of the big heavyweight vehicles, if it weighs over 6,000 pounds, it qualifies for something called 100% bonus depreciation, making the full purchase price of that vehicle dollar for dollar tax deductible against self-employed income or real estate related income, mostly non passive type active income. Uh, it can't offset my W-2 income because I'm not self-employed, uh, but it can offset my wife's business income who is self-employed. It can offset uh, some of my real estate related income sources on my return, but I cannot do this. I cannot write this off against my W-2 income because Bob Hall, the founder of our company, the owner, he's the self-employed individual in our relationship. So he gets to take these write-offs, whereas I cannot. So I have to have other revenue streams in order to maximize these deductions. This 100% bonus depreciation benefit ends as of December 31st, not fully, but it adjusts from 100% down to 80% as of January 1st of 2023. So we are seeing a 20% reduction in benefit on this particular write-off for heavyweight vehicles. If you're looking to purchase a new vehicle, by the way, have this conversation with your tax advisor. There's a proper way to acquire it, to title it, to insure it, to make sure or ensure that you get that full, full benefit. If you're not looking for that heavyweight vehicle, but you are looking for a new vehicle, uh, you, it doesn't matter if it's over 6,000 pounds or not. I mean, sure, that gets the 100% benefit on that end. But if the vehicle weighs under 6,000 pounds, you still get a nice write-off for it, but it's limited to $18,200 in the first year. And the remaining value of the vehicle is then written off over the remaining five years of the lifespan of the asset. So vehicles have a five-year lifespan. If you're not if you're not looking to buy a new vehicle, don't worry. Under the 2020 tax rules, the the um, the Pandemic Related Cares Act, the federal government actually said, "Hey, the vehicle doesn't even have to be new to you. You could look out the front window at that car that's parked in your driveway that you're currently leasing. You can actually buy out that leased vehicle and convert it." to a depreciating asset and take the bonus depreciation on that vehicle. That was new as of 2020. And it doesn't have to be a 2022 model, remember. So it doesn't. It has to be new to you under the old code. Now you can buy out the leased car and convert that to a depreciating expense. But it can be a 2018, it could be a 2016, shoot, it could be a 2009 model vehicle if you really wanted to buy a 2009 you know, heavyweight vehicle. But it doesn't have to be new as far as model or year is concerned. Uh, it just has to be acquired, titled, insured the correct way in order to, to get that full benefit. But the 100% benefit drops to 80% in 2023, drops to 60% in 2024, 40% in 2025. It fully sunsets and exhausts itself in 2027. So make sure that you set aside some time prior to the end of the year to figure out if this is something that if you've already been talking about buying a new vehicle, why not push forward with that and acquire that vehicle prior to December 31st? Just the last thing on this slide before we move on, I had a client earlier today and I did want to point this out. A client said, well, I put a deposit down on a vehicle, but it's not going to be delivered until next February. And I said, unfortunately, the rule in, in the Internal Revenue Code states that the deduction is based on date placed in service, which the deposit on the, on the car is not date placed in service. It's actually when you take ownership of the vehicle, the keys are in your hand and you can actually turn the ignition yourself. So it has to be based on date placed in service. So if you're looking for that massive end of year write-off, this could be what you're looking for outside of deferred retirement contributions, cost segregation, some other things that we'll talk about tonight. Um, but this is absolutely a, just a, a huge benefit for self-employed individuals and real estate investors. Number four deduction that we saw change the most during the pandemic, legal and professional fees. We saw a lot of people uh, starting incorporated entities. We saw people starting or setting up living trusts. Uh, we saw a lot of advancement in people's portfolios, so adding forms to tax returns, so increased fees with tax advisors and financial planners. Uh, in 2018, the federal government made a big stink about legal and professional fees not being tax deductible anymore. But what they failed to really make certain as, as they were telling people this is that the general public should have understood or what they failed to make them understand 
is that that rule only applies to W-2 employees. So W-2 wage earners like myself at Robert Hull and Associates, I'm not allowed to deduct legal and professional costs against my W-2 income. But against my self-employed income and my real estate income, I'm still allowed this as a dollar for dollar deduction. So it really was only a portion of the US tax paying population that lost this as a write-off. Legal and professional fees was a very consistent uh, and sizable deduction during the pandemic year. So make sure that you're maximizing that write-off. Last but not least, number five, this is really key for real estate investors. Um, if you are acquiring long-term investments, and a long-term investment can include both the 12 and 24-month leased investment properties that you own, as well as the Airbnb and VRBO kind of short-term investments. When I, when I say long-term, I mean a, a property that you've owned or plan to own for more than a year and a day. That, that is what converts the property into a long-term asset. So with long-term rental investments, we've seen a lot of people exercising their right to accelerate bonus depreciation. Unlike the bonus depreciation on the vehicle, this is a little different. So we're not talking about the bonus depreciation on the heavyweight, heavyweight vehicle anymore. We're talking about the depreciation on real estate, actual tangible assets, uh, property. And so there's, some, there's a special election under the current Internal Revenue Code called cost segregation, which is a special election to change, I don't wanna bore you with the details, but the, the, the terminology is a change of accounting method with the IRS, telling the government that instead of taking my building and depreciating it over its lifespan of 27 and a half years, I wanna take and, and break apart that property into different depreciable um, buckets, so to speak. So some property that's attached to your rental property will have a five-year lifespan. Some will have a 10-year lifespan. Some will have a 15 and 20-year lifespan. The building, the structure itself will have a 27 and a half year, life years, uh, 27 and a half, uh, year, year lifespan. But the key here is to figure out what you can separate out of that 27 and a half year period and drop into the bucket of 20 years or shorter. Because under cost segregation, imagine this, let's say that you have great cash flow on your properties. Let's say you have other investment vehicles, K-1 investments or self-employed income where you're making $100,000, $200,000 in profit coming, at, coming into the end of 2022. Well, that is all non-passive income for you, self-employed income. And, and you're talking with your tax preparer about, hey, I don't want to buy a new vehicle. So what else can I do aside from deferred comp and putting money into my retirement plan, buying a new vehicle? Is there anything else I can do? Well, if you file a cost segregation analysis or election on your return, the federal government will allow you to reach forward into future years, take future year depreciation deductions and accelerate them to take them all in this year as a dollar for dollar deduction. On the ta in the tax industry, it's called a 481A adjustment, and that could be hundreds of thousands of dollars in future year depreciation the government is allowing you to take in this current year. Now, for those of you who are veteran investors, we do understand that if you ever sold that property or when you sell that property, if you're accelerating all this depreciation upon the year of sale, you have to recapture that depreciation and pay tax on it. But there's an, another part of the Internal Revenue Code that allows us, instead of selling the property, we can actually exchange that property as part of a 1031 tax deferred or like kind exchange, avoiding all of the capital gain tax, avoiding all of the recapture depreciation tax, and allowing you to exponentially grow wealth in your real estate investment portfolio and in your personal lives. So cost segregation has been, uh, I'll tell you this, in the past two and a half years, I've filed more tax returns with cost segregation elections than collectively over my 19 year career. So you can tell how popular this election has become and it has saved taxpayers hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in tax, if not at this point, millions of dollars just in my column. Um, one specific example on Monday of this week, uh, I got an email from a client who had just spoken with a cost seg specialist. He said, uh, the election is to accelerate $171,000 of future year bonus depreciation. And this client has a ton of paid off properties, got some other non-passive investment vehicles. And that $171,000 write-off is deducted on the federal and the state side. Just by accelerating that for 2022, we had calculated that it would save them upwards of $90,000 in federal and state income tax. And the cost seg election analysis cost him like $1,500. And he doesn't ever plan on selling his property. He only plans on exchanging the property, which in theory is kicking the tax can down the road until he kicks the can. I always like using that, that reference because he doesn't actually ever have to pay the tax on the recapture depreciation or capital gain if he just holds the property until he dies and just receives that nice dividend cash, play, uh, cash flow from his real estate portfolio. So 
have this conversation with your tax advisor. I feel like for some of you who have invested in real estate and are looking for that added benefit prior to the end of the year, a cost segregation might be the key for you to help reduce all of that taxable revenue. Um, let's talk really quickly about some, some misconceptions of the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and kind of squash, squash some misconceptions that might keep you up at night, uh, you know, sitting, sitting in bed or sitting at home worrying about the 87,000 new agents the IRS hired or what's happening with bonus depreciation or what happened with Section 1031 of the Internal Revenue Code. I know that the Inflation Reduction Act started off as what's called Biden's Green Book. That was last October. And about two months ago, they, they actually signed into effect or put into place the Inflation Reduction Act. And a lot of things that were potentially going to be changed ended up being squashed at the 23rd hour. One thing in particular was Section 1031. They were actually considering changing a part of the Internal Revenue Code that's been around for over 100 years. Section 1031 has been around for over 100 years, and that allows people to sell their capital assets, their properties, into an exchange and turn one door into 50, uh, turn five doors into 10, turn one door into a duplex. Uh, you can mix and match investment property in an exchange, and it allows you essentially to double down, triple down, quadruple down, 10x, 20x down, double down on your investment. Uh, I had one client last year go from a beautiful one a single family residence in Burbank, California, uh, worth about four and a half million dollars, and he exchanged it for 35 doors elsewhere in the US. So now he's got 35 doors that he's collecting rent on rather than one renter in a beautiful property, obviously, in Burbank, California. But instead of having one renter, he now has 35 people paying him rent on a monthly basis, and he's got accelerated depreciation, all of these great things that kind of come into play. And he was able to do that because Section 1031 did not change. He had originally bought the property for like six hundred or seven hundred thousand dollars. It was worth four and a half million, I believe, when he sold when he exchanged it. And if he had sold it instead of exchanging it, he would have paid over fifty percent of that back to Uncle Sam. Uh, Twenty percent federal capital gain, ten point three percent state, three point eight percent net investment tax, and then obviously pushing all the rest of his capital gain and dividend income into a much higher income bracket. So the numbers just made sense to go ahead and move forward with the ten thirty one exchange, and that allowed him to take all of those years of appreciation and value in his property and turn it into thirty five cash flowing investments elsewhere in the U.S. The federal government, for a brief moment in time, was talking about limiting the amount of deferred gain to $500,000 per taxpayer. Absolute insanity. I mean, the exchange industry alone uh, creates over 600,000 jobs globally for the global economy. It generates over 45 to $50 billion in revenue for the federal government on a year-to-year -year basis. And 1031 exchanges make up for 65% of all United States real estate transactions. So you're talking about altering an industry that will impact. I mean, the trickle off effect of that might have been uh, catastrophic, in my opinion. But at the 23rd hour, they decided, no, we're not going to change this 100 year old part of the code. We're going to keep the limit to, to that we're going to get rid of any limits, right? So there is still no limit on the amount of deferred gain in a 1031 exchange. Beautiful, beautiful plan. Love that they didn't change that. Um, bonus depreciation rules, like I mentioned earlier, the bonus depreciation on the heavyweight vehicle dropping from 100% as of December 31st down to 80% as of January 1st of, of 2023. Then it tapers off into 60%, 40%, 20%, and fully sunsets by 2027. So make sure that you understand what is changing simply just right around the corner, right? In a month and a half, we're going to see a lot of those changes go into effect. Uh, cap gain rates ended up not changing. They were actually talking about changing the highest capital gain rate to 39.6% from 20% long-term capital gain. So right now, long-term cap gain is between 15 and 20%, depending on your income bracket. They were talking about changing long-term capital gain to 39.6% if your capital gain bumped you as a single individual above $500,000 of income or a married filing joint uh, filing, so married filing joint couple above a million dollars. Well, if you add it all up, 39.6% at that point, plus about 10% state plus 3.8% net investment tax, every dollar in capital gain above one of those two thresholds would have been paying over 50% of tax back to Uncle Sam and the state agency. So Glad they didn't change that as well. So once again, squashing some misconceptions here. One thing that I'm really, really excited to see is the change to the energy efficiency credits. A lot of green initiative behind the Inflation Reduction Act. Solar credits are bumping from 24% to 30% as of January 1st of 2023. So if you are considering putting solar on your primary residence, on a second home, or even a rental property, at least open up the conversation with a solar company now 
because I foresee that with this change in credit, once the general public really grasps this change in the internal revenue code, that there's going to be supply chain issues in 2023 on this. So at least open up the conversation with a solar company, get the conversation rolling and have an installation date, maybe in first or second quarter of 2023. So you can take 30% of the overall solar system improvement as a dollar for dollar credit against your bottom line liability. If the solar improvement is on a rental property, not only do you get the solar credit of 30%, but then you get to accelerate the depreciation on the equipment improvement altogether. I mean, we're talking about massive overall tax savings simply by just opening up a conversation today to have that installed in the year of 2023. Um, and then just to help everybody sleep better at night, I know that we've all heard this 87,000 number kind of ringing in the, in the media outlets and, and on our smartphones. Oh my gosh, the IRS went on a hiring spree. Well, just to give you a, qu a quick breakdown of stats here, I consider me personally, I don't know how anybody else feels about this, but I feel like the middle of the pandemic was the first and second quarter of 2021. I think we're coming out of this, even though I have COVID, I feel like the pandemic, just economically speaking, the bottom or the middle of it was probably first or second quarter of 2021. And at the middle of that pand of the pandemic timeframe, the federal government employment numbers dropped to an all-time low of 35,000 employees that work, work for the, working for the IRS uh, in 2021. That's what created this $3 million do document backlog. Uh, that's what created the three to four hour wait times on the phone, um, backlog in processing refunds and issuance of, of checks for the stimulus checks. I mean, it was a nightmare in 2021. Um, and the federal government knew that on average, they had consistently had about 80 to 90,000 employees on staff uh, prior to the pandemic. So they were, they were due for hiring anyway. I think that a greater portion of the 87,000 new agents are just filling seats with butts at this point. But also throw in another statistic, the federal government prior to the pandemic had estimated that 65% of their workforce was entering into retirement as of 2026. So they, once again, they were already planning on hiring new agents simply to fill seats with butts. It's just the pandemic kind of expedited that process. Uh, I know that that a lot of my clients were emailing and calling saying, uh, is the risk of audit going to increase because of the new agents that they're hiring? And sure, there's a lot of speculation around that, but I don't listen to CNBC or Fox News or KTLA5 when I need tax advice, right? When I, I go right to the source. So when I call the IRS on, you know, asking about questions on a 2553 S election form or on a client's file waiting to see when the refund's going to be issued or when the return's going to be fully processed, I always pick the brains of the IRS agents because they're the ones on the ground floor. And a lot of those agents have told us that a lot of those people that, that left during the pandemic, they just went into full-blown retirement. So that kick started that 65% retirement age at, you know, in 2026, that kick started that movement. And now a lot of people have just, just left working for the IRS. They're happy with their government pensions. They're not planning on coming to work again for the IRS. So they had to hire all of these individuals. And I want to, once again, to help you sleep better at night, if there was even an uptick in, in potential for audit or, or an uplay or an uptick in, in the number of audits, we wouldn't even see that statistic until 2026 or 2027. So currently in 2022, uh, we've got a long period of time before we see any case study around the Inflation Reduction Act and if it impacted the, the risk or potential for audit. Uh, so hopefully that helps everybody sleep a little bit better at night. Um, I did want to end on this slide just to let you know that we do offer free consultations, just like our educational webinars um, are all free. We do 140 events on a year to year basis. Uh, if you are looking to have a second opinion on a tax return that's been filed for 2021 or for 2020 or for 2019, um, or if you just think that everything was filed correctly, but you want free advice, uh, go ahead and text Robert Hall to the number 72,000 or take a picture of that QR code and that will automatically prompt you to sign up for a free consultation. If you're not looking to onboard, if you have a great relationship with your tax preparer and you just want to know about our free educational webinars, sign up for this and only on board for the free educational webinars. This is like a win-win situation uh, for, for new clients and even current clients who didn't know that we had free educational webinars. Now you know. Uh, but through this free consultation, we'd like to see at least two years of tax returns to so 2021 and 2020. Check those returns for any possible audit triggers or red flags. We'll squash all of those if we need to go back and amend things or add things. We'll go ahead and advise on that as well. 
But most importantly, you'll be added to this free periodic tax email update that will let you know about upcoming free educational webinars. Um, and that's you know what's better than free education these days. It's it's free. It just is a matter of you setting aside some time to sit in front of your computer screen or come in person to, to learn a little bit about an, an industry that isn't always the sexiest topic to discuss, right? Uh, taxes are not sexy, but I think that wealth retention is, and that's what we help people do at Robert Hall and Associates. We help them retain wealth. Um, so I think we have some time for some Q&A now. We'll go ahead and open it up for questions and fire away. I'm ready to answer whatever questions you might have. Who's got questions? Got questions. Yeah, just stand up and or be and be loud. Uh, can you prepay twelve months of expenses like my lease? Your le leased car? Um, so no, no, so no, 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 my, my rent for the location for my business. For the rent for oh the location for your business absolutely I mean if you want to prepay twelve months and take that as a deduction what you're doing is you're buying out next year's tax write offs but it kind of starts this snowball effect right so I've seen a lot of clients do that where they prepay a full year's lease amount um, and nothing in the Internal Revenue Code states that you cannot do this the government doesn't like doing that and to be real honest with you when you do that. And, and you didn't do that in years past, you do see a fluctuation in deduction amount, right? So if you're paying uh, you know, $12,000, $1,000 a month in office rent, let's say one year, and you decide to prepay next year's $12,000 as well, and it goes from 12,000 to 24,000, and then down to zero the following year, that is probably what throws up triggers the most or that what, what triggers the red flag scenarios the most with the IRS because it's an algorithm. It's a computer system that audits returns. It's not individuals actually sitting down and saying, oh, well, Tony Watson looks like a person that I need to audit here. It's a computer system that looks at the, the differences year over year in deductions. Now, dropping from 24,000 to zero doesn't really flag anything, but going from zero back up to 24,000 or back up to 12,000 without an address change on the return, Remember, the tax return has to tell the story to the IRS that could potentially throw up some red flags. So you just have to be aware that it might be a great tax write off to do this, but it could throw off or skew that that algorithm, that statistic that the government is looking or co government's computer system is looking at. And one year is the most you do, right? You can't do two or three. That is correct. It would be only 12 months. It could not be three or four years that you can that you can accelerate the payment for. But that's illegal. And even if you get out of it, that's fine, right? So say that again. Uh, but it's legal, right? Even if you get out of it, it's no problem. You could. Uh, the agent, if they if they saw that you were prepaying something that um, that also changed in that in that current year, let's say that you made a deal with somebody to say that you prepaid a certain amount, but you couldn't actually prove that the money came out of your bank account. That's where the government really starts to get involved in the in the audit process that deep dive is if you have somebody say that you prepaid all of that amount, but maybe you only paid 50%. If the dollar amount out of your account matches the amount that is on the invoice or that is in the contract, because if you prepay three or four years of rent on a place, you better have that in writing with somebody saying that you've already prepaid those following years uh, of payments. So if it all matches up, it should fly. It should, what, what, what our audit division, the head of our audit division calls the smell test with the IRS. It should pass the smell test every time. So let's say, I don't have a W-2, but I have the retirement, a first retirement, and I get uh, money from a 457. Is that pretty much like a W-2 to where can I, or can I take taxes, like if I buy a vehicle or something like that, can that, can I take money from that or can I depreciate it and use that? Yeah, so great question. So so when you, when you talk about W-2 income and retirement income and social security income and unemployment income, you're, you're, you're talking about a bucket of revenue that is called, that is considered unearned revenue. Even though you earn that revenue in a past year and you're deferring the tax on it, when you start to collect from a 401k, 457 or an IRA, that is all considered to be unearned income. So the car would not be an offset to the 1099R income that you're, that you're reporting from the 457. How However, you have a unique opportunity in retirement to, to pick what kind of professional you are, right? So when you have all unearned revenue as a main source of income, your occupation should never be retired. Literally, the, the page two of your 1040 tax return at the very bottom, it says it has an occupation box, and it'll tell the government what your occupation is. You should never, ever put 
retired in that box. You should put, when you go into retirement, you should put investor or real estate professional or, or rental property manager or something so that when you do start to incur costs like a car purchase or you start to add properties to your portfolio and you have these forms that are filed with your return, that you are not limited to the amount of loss deductions on those forms. Because if, if you say that you're retired and you're not actively participating in some sort of real estate activity, your real estate rental property losses and other business losses may be limited. And so in retirement, you have a unique opportunity to say, hey, I'm not retired. I might be collecting retirement income, but I am not retired as far as occupation is concerned. I am actually a real estate investor, which allows you to open up a whole world of additional tax write-offs and, and tax shelters. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to know if, uh, as a passive investor, uh, you mentioned that you can do up to six thousand pounds a year. Whether uh, if you're a passive investor, you're able to qualify for that kind of uh, deduction. Non-passive, not passive. No, yeah, no, it has to be non-passive. Passive means that you do not have decision-making power in the investment. So passive would be like me investing in a real estate syndication and getting a K-1 or a Schedule E for that passive syndication where I have no decision-making power. I don't actively participate in that business. It's just an investment. It's like me buying Google stock, right? I don't, I don't, I'm not an executive at Google. I just own part of their shares. That would be a passive type investment revenue source for me. So in order to take active business expenses, like a car depreciation write-off, your income would have to be non-passive in order to take that deduction. And uh, I really need a question. If you're a passive investor investing to an LLC, what are some of the deductions that you can take? Uh, are you able to deduct like office space or, 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 or things like that? Yeah, there, there, there's some there's some ways to navigate around a little bit of those restrictions. If you set up an LLC and the LLC is is mainly set up to invest in real estate investments and you're actively managing the LLC, the LLC that you own is a business, right? So the one thing that you don't want to get caught up with is showing massive losses on an LLC to offset passive income investments that are owned by the LLC. Because he, here, here's what happens. If you are a single member LLC, all of this stuff is filed on your personal return. And if the passive investments are real estate related losses, those won't be deductible anyway. And if they're passive income investments and you have non-passive expenses like a car deduction or legal and professional fees or a cell phone cost, those non-passive expenses still will not be an offset to the passive income you're getting from these investments. So the LLC can show a loss, but what the federal government is really focusing on now is, is what's called a basis calculation for businesses, meaning that did you invest enough capital into the LLC to cover the loss deduction that you're incurring. Uh, so if you are going to deduct expenses through a single member LLC or a multi-member LLC and all of your other revenue sources in that LLC are passive, you have to make sure that, let's say you have $100,000 in expenses through the business, you have to make sure that you've at least contributed or capitalized your LLC account with at least $100,000 of your own cash, because that's what establishes basis in your property. Kind of like when you buy a property, when you buy a rental investment, you have a $200,000 down payment, you finance $800,000 total purchase price of a million. Your equity in the business, equity in the property at that point is $200,000. You're borrowing $800,000 on the property. When you sell the property, you get to fully deduct the $200,000 to offset gain, right? So that establishes equity, that establishes capital investment in that in that that rental property in that scenario. The business side is very similar nowadays, where in order for you to take losses against that business investment, you have to capitalize the account with equal amounts of cash or more to cover that loss deduction on the personal side. Um, I don't know if that overall made sense. It made sense as it was coming out of my mouth, but if you want to talk in more detail about that, we can absolutely map out a plan. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> I'm sorry, my, my throat's a little hoarse, hoarse now. Um, You're good. I can ask another question. Yeah, sure. Um, if I buy a property in the next three weeks and rent it out for seven days or, or less on average, and I uh, manage it myself for over 100 hours, can I use a full depreciation, the, the cost segregation? So in theory, yes, if you close on that property prior to the end of the year and they can separate, because remember the cost segregation election is taking the property itself, separating, separating out every piece of the property that can be 
under 20 years in depreciation. So, so they're, they're taking the 27 and a half years and breaking it into a, a five year, a 15 year, a 20 year bucket, and then the 27 and a half years. But if you close on that property in December, it doesn't matter how much rental income you collect for the bonus depreciation. It's based on what they can separate out from the 27 and a half years. I literally just had a conversation with a client today about this on the phone uh, where he is looking for that final year deduction. He's a real estate professional out of Sherman Oaks. He's got great revenue for 2022 and he just doesn't have that much in expenses. He had great expenses last year because he bought a heavyweight vehicle and had prepaid lease payments on his office space. So he kind of bought all of those expenses for 2021 or sp spent all that money but he didn't have that many write-offs for 2022. So I sent him out uh, after the conversation to go and start looking for property. And as long as he closes on that property prior to the end of the year, that cost segregation election, it doesn't matter if you've owned it for the full year because you're taking an accelerating future year depreciation, not accelerating current year depreciation. So it has nothing to do with when you close on the property. You're actually, you could close on the property December 25th, Christmas day, right? And you're accelerating 2023, 2024, 2025, 2026, all of that future year depreciation to take it all in this year. So to wow. answer your question, no, it does, doesn't matter if you close before the end of the year, you can do the cost seg for that, for that property I'm, as well. I'm not a real estate professional at all. Okay, so if you're not a real estate professional, then you have some limits as to what kind of losses you can deduct on your individual return. At $100,000 of adjusted gross income, all the way up to 150 in adjusted gross income, you start to phase out from being allowed any real estate losses to offset your income if you are not a real estate professional. At 150,000 AGI, if you aren't a real estate professional and you don't check the that you don't make the election for real estate professional status, you lose all real estate related losses on your return completely. It's not that you lose them, you just can't use them. So those become unallowed passive loss carry forwards and they carry forward to offset future revenue, but they will not offset your current year revenue simply because you make too much uh, above 150,000. I know it's such a small threshold for this, this deduction, but the federal government's very specific that at 150 grand AGI, if you're not a real estate professional, you are not allowed loss deductions. You can use the expenses to the extent of rental income collected and not pay any tax on the rental income. But as far as the loss is concerned, you have to suppress it and carry forward to offset future revenue. If your income's over 150. What about the short-term rental loophole that I've heard of? Short-term rental loophole? Well, there, there's a ton of loopholes. What, 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 what do you mean? Um, if you rent it out uh, on average seven days or less for the year and you contribute 100 hours, you uh, you don't have to be a real estate professional to do the cost segregation and take all the depreciation this year. So once again, you can still do the cost segregation. I, I, like I said, you can still do that. It, it, that's not a really a loophole. Uh, you, they, they're, there's something called the 14 day rule where you can rent out a property. And we've only got what, how many days left in the year? A uh, month and a half, not even. You can rent out a property for 14 days and not pay any tax on the rental income. That's called the 14 day rule. If you rent out a property for seven days, you don't have to you don't have to pay any tax on it. Why would you even report that on your return if it's not going to give you a benefit and your income's over 150? So there are a number of scenarios that you'd have to mix and match. If you're renting it for under 14 days in 2022, I wouldn't even report the income. Or I, I'd report the income, but then back it out with the election of the 14-day rule and not even pay tax on any of it. Uh, if you did cost segregation, you can you can take the loss on your return, but if your AGI is above 150 and your occupation is not a real estate investor or real estate professional, let's say you're a doctor, you cannot take that loss to offset your W-2 income. I can tell you that right now. And if somebody told you that was possible, that's completely false. Uh, my last question, I guess. Um, <laughs> as an insurance agent, do I uh, qualify for the QBI? Uh, at that point, your insurance agency would be a uh, professional service or trade business. So you would have a threshold of $450,000 before you fully phase out from being allowed QBI. And QBI is only on your, your active income. So if you have Schedule C income, if you have K-1 income that you actively participate in, QBI is on that. It's not on any W-2 income, any capital gain income, any dividend income. So there are thresholds for QBI, depending on if you're married or single. I would have to look up the thresholds. I don't know those off the top of my head, but anybody under a certain threshold qualifies for QBI, whether you're a specified trade or service business. But once you breach a certain threshold, you fully phase out from being allowed that. You're talking about the 20% um, qualified business income deduction. Yeah, it only applies to business income. It doesn't apply to, apply to W-2s or any other type of investment income. It has to be active, passive, are active non-passive income in order for you to qualify. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Yep. I have a question. Um, and I it's a little bit complicated. 
especially with where the market's going, can you do 1031 exchanges if you're going to carry back some? If you're going to carry back what, what maybe I missed the last part, carry back what? A loan on some of the, of the balance. Take a second. Like or or yeah, like to take a first um, so, cash or whatever. So you have to make sure that 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 you don't do it during the time of the exchange. So it, when you enter into an exchange, you have 45 days to identify up to three three properties, including the 45 days you have 180 days to actually close on the exchange. So you right. do not want to tap into equity or mess around with any debt on the property uh, during that period of time. So you would have to wait for the exchange to close. And, and the dust to settle, and then you could tap into the equity or pull equity lines on the property. But do not do it in the time in that 180 day time frame. And once again, unless you close within 40 or 50 days on the new property, I wouldn't touch any of that because remember that the the debt that you carry on the prime on the first home has to be equal to the debt that you carry on the second home or the multi multiple investments that you're exchanging into. Unless you're bringing cash to the table at that point, if you bring cash into the investment, you can reduce the debt on the newly acquired property. So there's a there's a mix and match that you can can kind of work with, but do not touch the debt or do not try to pull out equity during the actual exchange period. That that could that could be, your properties could fall out of the exchange because you're altering the debt ratios on the property during that time frame. The the property is on free and clear, and it would be a seller carry back. So once again, you, you would have to do the seller carry back or any financing options prior to the exchange or after the exchange closes. Okay, so you could do a seller carry back. And then how would the new property have to be structured? Would it have to have the same amount of debt? How much, how would you, and then how would you structure when that debt was paid off down the road? Yeah, so so I mean, if you have, once again, they're, they're, I'm assuming there's a formal note on the property for the carry back financing and everything. There's actual formal documents on it. It's not a family member of any sort. So if it's all formalized as a note, it would have to be equal debt uh, on the new properties as well. So you'd essentially just tell the person who's doing the carry back financing that we're going to do the same thing on the new property, or you can find another loan, another lender to pay off that debt and acquire the same amount of debt on the new investments that are purchased. So uh, once again, pro probably a, a lot of pieces to that puzzle, but it, once again, it has to be like kind in all facets, unless you are uh, bringing cash to the table. And at that point you could take on less debt on the new property. Um, but you know, whether it happens before the exchange starts or after the exchange is settled, those are the two times that you can mess around with the debt ratios, um, even with, with carry back financing options. Hope, I don't know if that answered your question. Hopefully it did. That helps. Yeah. Okay. But it'd be helpful to talk to a qualified person. Yeah, to go sure. I, just was That's complicated. I was just wondering if that would work. All right. One more question. All right. Super quick. I think just kind of real invest real estate investing just kind of one-on-one -on -one. did you kind of sort of wink towards like if you're going to get into like real estate investing maybe going with like a single member or like multi-member llc in other words the llc is the mode of incorporation if you will certainly as opposed to like being like an s corporate Sure. So, so the one reason why you would never want to acquire rental properties under an S corporation is because when you purchase a property under an S corp, you are trading the value of the property for shares of a corporation. So let's say that 10, 15 years down the road, I decide that I don't want that property in an S corp. I'd rather hold it under my personal name for, I don't know, liability purposes. Let's say the S corporation is being sued. So I want to distribute that property to myself personally. I'm not selling it in this scenario, but the federal government sees it differently. If I bought that property for 500,000, now it's worth 1.2 million. And it was under the S corporation, which I had originally transferred at a $500,000 purchase price, right? So I have $500,000 in shares. 10 years down the road, I take that property back to my personal name. It's worth about 1.2 million at that time. Even though I didn't sell it, the federal government assumes that I sold shares of a corporation. I pay tax on $700,000 of capital gain. So S corporations should really never own long-term investments. S corps are great for flipping properties because if you're a property rehabber or a flipper and you're subject to self-employment tax, the S corporation will help you reduce self-employment tax by upwards of 60 to 65%. So flippers use S corporations, long-term investors use LLCs. There is no income tax benefit to an LLC. It is only used for liability protection. And my first rental property that I purchased, I just had a killer insurance policy on it. I did not need an LLC because it was the only asset that I owned at the time. And I didn't have any, any you know, 401ks or brokerage accounts or anything of value. I had a small W-2 at the time. So I chose not to have an LLC. Now, fast forward uh, to now that I'm 40 years old, I have 
many LLCs on my properties in Austin, Texas. I've got two S corporations. My wife is set up as an S corporation because I have a lot more at stake now. So I went ahead and did all of those LLCs simply to create greater levels of asset protection and separate my assets from each other and from my personal liabilities. Um, right. LLCs are great for liability protection. No tax benefit though. Tony, thank you so very, very much. I'm gonna catch you off there. <coughs> Sounds good. You did a great job not coughing. I'm sure you also did a great job presenting Tony as well, not just not coughing. So normally we would invite Tony to stay and hang out and answer your questions, but you guys have his contact information right here. So it's pretty easy to be able to get a hold of him, right? Tony, you're available for phone calls to answer Absolutely. people's questions. So right now the schedule is pretty booked, but our firm has senior consultants available for in-person appointments or digital appointments. My schedule, unless there's a cancellation between now and December 31st, I have very little uh, very little availability this year. But for tax season, we haven't even started booking for tax season. So I'm, I'm open for business uh, this coming season. So Tony, I'm going to confess, I'm trying to get him. I, I try to get my speakers on my podcast. I had to have a conversation with Mike, I think three or four of them to find an time one time in his schedule before January 1st. And I have it on my calendar. Do not cancel for any reason because I will have to wait till after January 1st to get another time with Tony. Tony, you're awesome. Thank you so very much. You did it once, one more time. You hit it out of the park. It was just fantastic. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. having me, Christina. All right, good night. <laughs>